so um, hi uh, as you guys can see I'm in a new setting I'm actually in my classroom the lighting is a little strange I don't have the natural light from the window um, and then I have this uh, microphone set up and uh, <laughs> some of you guys were saying that it looks like I'm going to take your order at McDonald's well the thing is, is I have the AC on constantly in this room and so it's a little loud so that's why I have this microphone set up but I hope that uh, you guys are able to hear me and that the sound of my breathing isn't too distracting. All right, so let's move this screen out of the way. Um, so for this recording, I want to attempt to go over uh, the immune system, the plant system, bacteria, yeast, and animal development. Okay, so those are the ones that I'm attempting to go over and if I get interrupted, which there has been a lot of interruptions at school, then uh, we'll press pause and then I'll continue recording uh, later. Okay, so let's go to the PowerPoint then. And we're going to move down to the immune system right over here. So communication in the immune system. I'm going to have to move my face to you out of the way. Maybe push it all the way to the side. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so the immune system. And we have several lines of defense. The two main categories, um, the line of defense, we have innate immunity. Innate immunity is basically the immunity that you are born with. Okay, inborn immunity. And then you also have acquired immunity. This is the type of immunity that um, you get in your lifetime as you grow and you you know encounter pathogens in your lifetime so innate would be what you are born with and then acquired is what you gain in your lifetime okay and innate immunity is what you're born with so these are non-specific defense mechanisms basically this is how your body defends itself against pathogens um, like, for example, your skin. Your skin is a barrier. It's a natural barrier, defense against pathogens. And then you have mucous membranes, like the sticky mucus that's produced in your mouth, in your nose. Um, that is a, a sticky mucus layer that's going to protect you from pathogens. Okay? Um, secretions of skin, like oils, um, acids, um, and mucous membranes that are just going to provide the first line of defense. The second line of defense, you have these white blood cells, these phagocytic white blood cells that are just basically patrolling your body and looking out for pathogens that it can engulf by phagocytosis. That's why it's called phagocytic white blood cells. And you have antimicrobial proteins, okay, like um, the complement system that are going to go out and look for pathogens and destroy uh, the pathogens. And then you have the inflammatory response. You know, if you get a paper cut, um, when you get a paper cut or you get pricked by a needle that is not sterile, then you're basically um, putting bacteria into your skin, the layer of your skin, and then you have an inflammatory response. And we don't really have time to go over that, but basically white blood cells are going to go to the area of uh, compromise where you've had that paper cut or you've been pricked by an unsterile uh, needle, then the white blood cells are going to go there and start cleaning up that area. And histamines will be released, causing the area to swell up and become red. Okay, The one that we're going to be really focusing on for this topic are lymphocytes. Okay, Lymphocytes are your T cells, your B cells, and they communicate with each other. They communicate with your cells and they're going to, um, de you're going to develop acquired immunity, acquired immunity when they communicate with each other. Okay, antibodies are what are produced. These are proteins that are produced by your B cells. Okay, so antibodies are good. I know it sounds a little counterintuitive. Like when I see that word antibody, I feel like it sounds like it's against the body, but it's actually the opposite antibodies are produced in your body and they're going to attack the pathogen and they are going to attack antigens okay antigens antigens are foreign 
They could be pathogens, they could be viruses, they could be bacteria. For some people that are allergic to um, like maybe pollen, pollen is considered to be an antigen. It's foreign and you're going to your immune system is gonna to respond to something that's foreign, it's called an antigen. So antibodies are proteins produced by the B cells that are going to attack an antigen, okay? All right, so as I said, we're gonna really be focusing on lymphocytes. Again, lymphocytes are B cells and T cells. They're gonna communicate with each other, okay? Here is an uh, antigen presenting cell, or this is a type of white blood cell. And I think I might have a better picture of this on another slide, but this is a white blood cell that has engulfed a antigen, and it's gonna present the antigen to a helper T cell, okay? That's why it's called the antigen presenting cell, because it swallows it up, it cuts up the antigen, and then it presents it to the outside, okay? So see these, um, these proteins? They're displaying the pieces of antigen to the helper T cell. And also this white blood cell is going to release a um, protein called an interleukin, an interleukin. So it's going to, first it's going to release these interleukin uh, proteins and they bind to a receptor protein on the helper T cell. And it's gonna cause the helper T cell to go to the antigen presenting cell and they're gonna make a connection their outer receptor proteins are going to connect together. It's a way that they are communicating. And that helper T cell is going to send um, a message to itself, interleukin 2. Remember, this is autocrine signaling. So this is a type of autocrine signaling to itself to make copies of itself so that it can go fight that specific antigen. So this cell is presenting an antigen and basically this helper T cell is going to make copies of itself to go um, in your immune system. It's going to go and make more copies of itself so it can uh, it can fight against that antigen, that specific antigen. Okay. In addition to that, the helper T cell is going to release these um, proteins called cytokines. Okay, these cytokines. And these cytokines, these are chemicals, these are ligands. Okay, these are ligands, these are molecules that are going to recruit cytotoxic T cells and B cells to fight that specific antigen, that specific antigen. Okay, so now what your immune system is doing is it is building an army. It's recruiting an army to fight that specific antigen. These cytotoxic T cells, what do they do? It's a type of um, lymphocyte, a type of T cell that can actually kill infected cells. So cytotoxic, that word cytotoxic sounds harmful, doesn't it? It's going to actually kill any cells that are infected with that antigen. So they will get rid of your own body cells that are infected with the antigen. And then the cytokines from the helper T cells are going to recruit B cells. And these B cells are going to start making antibodies that are going to attack that specific antigen. This is what we call humoral, humoral immunity, okay, where the B cells will produce antibodies, okay, that are going to fight specifically against antigens. So you guys, this is pretty amazing because your body is trying to fight against an antigen and the way that they, um, the way that your immune system builds up immunity against that specific antigen is by communicating, by these cells communicating with each other, these helper T cells, sending out messages to cytotoxic T cells and B cells, okay, using cytokines, okay? So, um, when the, uh, the helper T cell right, sends out a message, it could be a type of paracrine signaling, um, or when the antigen presenting cell here is communicating directly to the helper T cell, I wouldn't say that it's a gap junction, but it's where you have neighboring cells are touching, okay? Where you, um, they come close together and then the proteins will touch together, okay? That's how they communicate. So here we have that antigen presenting cell. Here is a white blood cell, for example, 
It takes in this virus, so it engulfs this virus by phagocytosis. That's why oftentimes white blood cells are called phagocytes. And then what happens is that when it takes it in, lysosomes are gonna cut up pieces of that virus. And then we're gonna be talking about MHC proteins in just a minute. But there are these proteins that are inside of this white blood cell that are going to take a piece of that antigen, take a piece of that virus and show it, present it to the outside of this white blood cell. It's gonna present it, okay? And it's going to show it to a helper T cell. That helper T cell is gonna recognize the antigen and then it's gonna send out these signals, okay? So the helper T cell is gonna signal cytokines, that's what those signals are called. Um, and those cytokines are going to stimulate B cells to start producing specific antibodies against. So these antibodies are going to attack those viruses, okay? And again, antibodies are proteins made by the B cell. And then also, these cytokines can signal and stimulate cytotoxic T cells, and these cytotoxic T cells are going to kill any infected cells that are infected with the virus, okay? So your cells, have, your immune system has a way of directly, directly attacking the virus and then also has a way of killing your own body cells that would be infected with the virus to prevent further infection, okay? So when I mention the MHC protein, the MHC protein, right over here, is inside of your cells, okay? So um, let's say that you have a cell that is infected with a virus, okay? And so your cells will um, um, take a piece of the antigen, bring it together with the MHC molecule, and in this case, it's called a class one MHC molecule, or class one MHC protein, and it will show, it's gonna show the antigen to a specifically a cytotoxic T cell. So this is a body cell that is infected. And so it's going to show the um, antigen to a cytotoxic T cell. And what's gonna happen next? Okay, uh, I am totally frozen. My video is no longer moving. I wonder what's going on here. All right, I'm gonna to have to press pause for. Okay, I don't know what happened there, but <laughs> my video was, was frozen, and so I had to kind of um, restart. Anyway, so as I was saying, um, the cytotoxic T cell then is going to recognize the antigen, and since this is an infected cell, the cytotoxic T cell, like we said before, sounds like you know it's gonna be bad, right? The cytotoxic T cell is actually going to release some chemicals, which we'll go over on um, in a few minutes. It's gonna release some chemicals that cause this infected cell to pop, um, and it's going to die, okay? Uh, and so it's an infected cell, so one way to get rid of the antigen is by getting rid of the infected cell. That's what cytotoxic T cells do. They kill infected cells. Whereas if we have another cell, this is a white blood cell or an antigen presenting cell or a macrophage, okay? When they engulf a microbe by phagocytosis, you have the class two MHC protein molecule. So with your body cells, they make class one MHC molecules, but the phagocytes and white blood cells, they make a different type of MHC molecule called class two, which is recognized by helper T cells, okay? the helper T cell recognizes the class two MHC molecule uh, and it's gonna recognize this antigen and that helper T cell is going to recruit other helper T cells, it's going to recruit B cells, and then it's gonna recruit cytotoxic T cells, okay? So these helper T cells, they are going to um, produce that class two MHC protein, right? that class two MHC molecular protein showing the antigen to a helper T cell. Um, one way that the helper T cell is actually going to, you know, be attached to that white blood cell is a CD4 protein. So that CD4, that CD4 um, protein is gonna, basically it's sort of like a docking mechanism where the two cells will 
come together and hold together um, and that's going to ensure that they're communicating with each other. So this binding keeps the helper T cell joined to the antigen presenting cell while activation occurs. And so once that helper T cell is activated, it's going to secrete those cytokines and those cytokines are going to stimulate itself, right, that would be autocrine signaling, to divide and make more of itself so that it can make more of itself to, um, to build this immune response to that specific antigen. Okay? And also those cytokines are going to cause cytotoxic T cells and B cells to look out specifically for the antigen. The cytotoxic T cells are going to look out for infected cells with that specific antigen, causing those cells to die. Okay? And then uh, the B cells are going to start making um, antibodies against that specific antigen. So those are the helper T cells, and then you have the cytotoxic T cells, which are going to have a surface protein called CD8, whereas with helper T cells it was CD4. Cytotoxic T cells have CD8, a surface protein that helps it um, latch on or dock onto the class 1 MHC molecule. So that CD8 molecule or protein is attached to the class 1 MHC molecule holding that target cell, that infected cell in place. So they are communicating, this is a way of communicating. Um, the infected cell is showing that antigen to the cytotoxic T cell and as a result that cytotoxic T cell is going to release two different kinds of proteins called granzymes and peripherin. Granzymes and peripherin are going to attach to the cell membrane of the infected cell, causing pores, and then that infected cell is going to burst. It's going to burst. It's called an apoptotic target cell. It's going to pop. It's going to burst. Okay? You know, um, oftentimes these cytotoxic T cells will target not only infected cells, but also cancer cells. So this is how a cytotoxic T cell will kill a cancer cell. It will recognize it as being a cancer cell. So it's not going to be, you know, it won't be showing an antigen, but it will recognize a cancer T, a cancer cell, and then release those granzymes peripherin, causing the cancer cell to burst. Okay. So again, um, this is how cells communicate with each other. The helper T cell, once it's bound to an infected. Um, I'm sorry, not infected cell, but a, uh, um, a phagocyte, a white blood cell, autocrine signaling causing it to make copies of itself. It's going to release cytokines that are going to activate cytotoxic T cells to look out for cells that are infected with that antigen. Those cytokines are going to signal B cells to make more of itself, and those are called memory B cells, by the way, and plasma cells that are going to produce antibodies. Okay. So, you know, you have, I, I, I said earlier how, you know, cells in your immune system are communicating and recruiting and making a big army, okay? You're, you're, you're producing a big army against a specific antigen. This is why, you know, you don't get sick from, you don't get sick uh, from the same antigen again, okay? So, for example, if you had the flu, you're not going to get the same flu again, okay? Because you have a army that is looking out for that specific virus. You have plasma cells that are constantly making these antibodies. You have memory B cells, okay, that are going to um, recruit uh, uh, plasma cells to make more antibodies. And then also these memory B cells are going to have antibodies on their surface. So antibodies, we're going to be talking about it again, but antibodies generally have a Y-shape, they're Y-shaped proteins that are going to look out for antigens. And then you have active and memory helper T cells looking out for that specific antigen. You have memory cytotoxic T cells that are going to kill any infected cells that are, you know, if the antigen happens to enter the body and infect a cell, those memory cytotoxic T cells are going to be around. Okay, and then you have active cytotoxic T cells that are actively, um, in, you know, actively um, fighting that antigen. Okay. Oh, um, 
So that active cytotoxic T cells, they're defending against infected cells actively, uh, any cancer cells, and any transplanted tissue that is um, foreign, recognizes being foreign, that is not your own. This is why when you get an organ transplant, you do need to um, find a match, right? A match, tissue that would be recognized as your own. Just really quickly, um, we don't, I don't think that this is that important, but there are basically five classes of antibodies or immunoglobins. Immunoglobins is just another word for antibody. There's IgM, IgG, IgA, IgD, IgE, but for the most part, antibodies have this Y shape, they're Y shaped proteins, okay? IgG is a monomer of a Y shaped protein. IgM is a pentamer, it has five, and my head is blocking it, but basically you have five of these guys attached to the center. IgA is a dimer because there's two of them. IgD is also a monomer, and then IgE is also uh, a monomer. If you have allergies, it is the IgE that is um, going to bind to the allergen, which is recognized as an antigen, allergen, antigen, okay? And it's gonna release histamines which is the allergic reaction that you experience, okay? Histamines causes um, inflammation in your skin or maybe your uh, around your eyes or your nose. You start to produce mucus and tears. I mean, for, I don't, luckily I don't have any allergies, but I know people that do and it's not, it's no bueno, no fun, right? And so what happens when these antigens attack Sorry, when these antibodies attack antigens, what do they do? There's several things that they can do. They can neutralize the virus, you know, neutralize the enemy. What do they do when they neutralize the enemy, when they neutralize the virus? The antibodies surround the virus, surround the bacteria, surround the pathogen, and they can't infect anymore. They're surrounded. You have antibodies surrounding them. So they're no longer um, able to do what they want to do, which is to infect or reproduce, okay? And then you have agglutination. Agglutination is when you have that antibody, and by the way, this is that pentamer, right? So this would be the uh, IgM. So this is IgM antibody, and there's one, two, three, four, five, okay? Five areas where the bacteria so five bacteria can be um, chained together. So these five bacteria are now immobilized. Okay, they're immobilized because um, the antibody is bringing them together and now they're stuck together. They can't do anything. They cannot infect, they cannot reproduce, okay? And then there's also something called precipitation where you have a chain of antibodies and antigens together. It's like a chain gang, okay? They're all chained together. This is sort of like um, if you have um, criminals, one, two, three, four, five, chained together. They're immobilized. They can't do anything, okay? Uh, and then also antibodies can um, uh, cause a foreign cell, okay, like a bacteria, to burst open. Okay, this is what we call the complement system, okay? And part of the complement system includes these antibodies that recruit complement proteins, and those complement proteins are going to recruit pore, um, pore forming proteins. Okay, and then they make a pore, and then the pore, <laughs> the the pore bacteria is going to burst open because of the pores. Oh my gosh, pore bacteria is going to have pores and burst open. Oh, I forgot to say, when the pathogens or antigens are immobilized, it enhances phagocytosis. They can't do anything. And so now the white blood cells, the phagocytes or macrophage, there's so many different words for white blood cell. White blood cell is a macrophage, is a phagocyte, okay? Uh, they can engulf the immobilized viruses and bacteria, okay? And once that happens, once that, um, white blood cell does that, what is going to happen? They're gonna present. They're gonna present the antigen um, to a helper T cell, okay? The helper T cell is gonna recognize a piece of the antigen and then it's gonna start recruiting, uh, releasing cytokines and recruiting other um, B cells and T cells, okay? 
so I'm going to uh, move on. Now we're going to move on to the next topic, which is cell communication in plants. You know, plants are amazing. One of my favorite organisms are plants. Okay, I know that sounds a little bit weird, but like I said to you guys earlier in the year, photosynthesis is my favorite chemical reaction. It's amazing what plants can do. And plants, believe it or not, can communicate with each other and also the plant body. There's a lot of communication going on within the plant body. You know, plant cells can communicate with each other through the plasmodesmata. Plasmodesmatas are these gaps between neighboring cells. They are analogous to gap junctions. Gap junctions are those openings between animal cells, but between plant cells, so animal cells, but between plant cells are called plasmodesmatas or plasmodesma as a singular. So plasmodesmata is plural, excuse me. I hope you guys didn't hear that. Then again, this is a microphone. <laughs> so um, signal molecules, okay, signal molecules can move from one cell to another through the plasmodesmata. Um, and so when I talk about cell communication, I could also be, t um, be talking about how a cell receives information from its environment, how a plant specifically receives information from its environment. So what has caused this potato to grow leaves? By the way, I have a potato in my classroom from fall 2000, is, gosh, is it 2019? It is 2019. I have a potato in here that has been sitting in here since fall, since September 2019. And last year before we went on lockdown, um, it actually started growing stems and leaves. Let me show it to you, and I hope you guys are not too grossed out by this. But it's just been sitting in my classroom, and we did name it um, Mr. Potato. Okay, so I, can you guys see that? So there's my potato. It's all dried and wrinkled up, but you can see the old stems there, right? And it had, it had leaves. <laughs> Okay, so how did it how did it start off with just stems in the dark and then how did it get leaves? Okay, this it's called light induced DET etiolation. Etiolation D etiolation means greening. Okay, greening of dark brown potatoes. So uh, before that potato was exposed to light, it looked like this. Okay, so if you guys ever have old potatoes in your home in your house. They start to grow, um, they're called eyes, they start to, at the eyes, they start to grow like little um, stems, okay? And then eventually, if you expose the potato to light, natural daylight, it's going to start making leaves, and that's called deetiolation, okay? How does a plant sense light? How does it sense light? Deetiolation, which is greening, happens because of a signal transaction pathway. It happens because of a signal transaction pathway, okay? First of all, light, okay, um, light is detected by a phytochrome receptor protein. There is a receptor protein in the cytoplasm of the plant. This is reception, okay? Light is detected by this phytochrome protein. It's activated. And once it becomes activated, it changes shape, and when it changes shape, it activates a whole signal transaction pathway. There's a whole trans, uh, signal transaction pathway. I looked it up. It is very complex. It's very well studied. Um, but in your textbook, we tried to simplify the signal transaction, signal transaction pathway. The, sing, the second messenger in the signal transaction pathway is called CGMP, not CAMP. Remember CAMP? with um, proteins um, where uh, protein hormones in the with us in our bodies when protein hormones bind to um, a receptor protein it activates a G protein which activates adenyl cyclase and adenyl cyclase will take ATP and make CAMP in this case it's not CAMP it's CGMP guanine triphosphate okay 
So the GA, G, C, GMP is a second messenger that activates this whole protein kinase cascade, okay? And once that happens, certain genes are going to be turned on, okay? Certain genes are going to be turned on. And when they are turned on, they're going to start making proteins that are going to cause the leaves to be formed, leaves to turn green. The stems are going to start to make uh, leaves, okay? Also, um, besides the signal transaction pathway with the second messenger CGMP, that uh, phytochrome protein that's activated causes calcium ion channels to open up. This is a protein ion channel. It will open up causing calcium ions to come in. And once the calcium ions come in, it activates a signal transaction pathway that involves protein kinases, okay? So what happens though is basically what happens is that genes are gonna be turned on that causes transcription and translation of greening protein. So let me move my face out of the way so you guys can see here that Transcription is going to take place. Translation will take place in the cytoplasm of these plant cells. And deetiolation response proteins are made. Okay? All right. Um, plant hormones. So now we're going to move on to the topic of plant hormones. Plant hormones are also called plant growth regulators. You know, these hormones, you guys can think of them as being signals, as being ligands, because... They're going to be used for communication, okay? Um, and by the way, you do not need to know all of these hormones. I'm just going to be talking about two hormones. I'm going to be talking about auxin and ethylene. But there are there are so many different pro, um, hormones like gibberellins. There's more than just what's on this table, by the way. Gibberellins are responsible for germination. They're going to cause a, G, a, a seed to germinate. They are also responsible for growth of a plant. It's gonna grow and mature. They are responsible for flowering, so for buds to flower. And then they are also responsible in, in um, a small way for fruit development, okay? Oxen is all responsible for growth and maturity, flowering, fruit development, cytokines. Okay, we're not gonna go over everything, but ethylene, we'll be talking about, is responsible for flowering and fruit development specifically for ripening. This has been studied a lot. There's so many studies about ethylene and fruit ripening, okay? And when we talk, uh, abscission, by the way, abscission is the loss of leaves, okay, the loss of leaves. All right, but anyways, let's talk about auxin. So auxin is a hormone that promotes apical dominance. That word apical refers to the apex, apex, which means top and dominance, top dominance, okay? The thing about auxin is that it is a hormone that is made at the apex, um, the apex of the plant. It's made at the shoot tip at the top, okay? And when auxin is made here, auxin will be moved down to all of the other parts of the plant. They're communicating um, the plant body. It releases this hormone and it, re it releases this hormone at the top, at the apex of the plant, and it's gonna move down and communicate to these axillary buds, okay, these axillary buds. These axillary buds are dormant. They're dormant, meaning that they, don't, um, they will not grow, okay? However, the further away that the um, apex shoot tip is from the bottom, um, you will actually see larger axillary buds because they're not getting uh, they're not getting a whole lot of auxin. Auxin is by the time it reaches the bottom, it's very diluted. I guess you can say there's not a high concentration of auxin at the bottom of the tree or the plant, so you actually start to see the development of axillary buds. There was um, you know a lot of experiments done where they cut off the tip. They cut off the tip. Um, the apex tip, and no auxin is being made. And when no auxin is made, then these um, dormant axillary buds, they start to grow. They're no longer inhibited, and they start to grow. This is how a lot of gardeners will try to get a bush very bushy. This is how you make it thick and bushy, okay? If you want a thick and bushy, let's say, basil plant, you just cut off the top tip, 
And then all of these little axillary buds will start to develop and you get more basal leaves. This is what personally I have experienced. That's why I'm talking about basil. If you want more basil leaves to put on your pizza or make pesto, you're going to remove the top apex tip and then it there's no more auxin being produced and that's going to allow for the axillary buds to grow. So auxin promotes apical dominance, shutting down the axillary buds. But if you remove it, then those axillary buds can grow. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I hope that wasn't too loud in the microphone. <clears throat> oh my goodness, sorry. I just swallowed and I made a weird sound. You guys I feel so bad for you if you're like listening to me drink water and make these weird sounds because of this microphone now you can hear every little sound from my face and that can be disturbing I apologize all right ethylene ethylene is a hormone um, and it's interesting because it is a very simple hydrocarbon okay so let me just draw ethylene for you it has two carbons and it has two, sorry, four hydrogens. So this is what ethylene looks like. And you guys remember that, eth, that carbon can make four covalent bonds. And each carbon has a covalent bond with two hydrogens. So we are left with two covalent bonds between the two carbons. So this is what ethylene looks like. It's a hydrocarbon. It's a very simple hydrocarbon. It has two carbons and four hydrogen so this is makes uh, it's gonna make it if you know if you guys were in class I would ask you guys uh, what property does uh, ethylene have and then I would be waiting for you guys to say that's nonpolar it is nonpolar because it's a hydrocarbon remember hydrocarbons are nonpolar so ethylene is a hormone that promotes fruit ripening flowering and many other responses in the plant and again this has been studied a lot okay and ethylene is uh, a very small molecule it's a gas okay it's a re it's released as a gas and it's in the air and because ethylene is nonpolar it can simply bypass the cell membrane and enter the cytoplasm of a plant cell and it's weird because these ethylene receptors are embedded in the in the ER the endoplasmic reticulum okay so um, on the, on the right side are pictures of ethylene binding to these receptor proteins embedded in the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. Once they bind to the endopla endoplasmic reticulum, there's a whole signal transaction pathway that is activated that causes ethylene responsive genes to be transcribed. So transcription takes place. Transcription takes place in the nucleus and then the mRNA comes out, and then the ribosome of those plants are going to translate those proteins. So translation takes place, and then you end up with proteins. And those proteins that are specific to, let's say, fruit ripening or flowering and other responses, okay? Um, so yeah, uh, when you know ethylene binds to these receptors, there's a whole signal transaction pathway. And you know what, you don't need to understand, you don't need to understand this whole pathway. Okay, it's very complicated. So like I said, plants are pretty amazing. They will communicate with each other and then they can communicate within the body. One really cool thing about plants is that they can fight, they have ways to fight against herbivores and pathogens. You don't really think about plants as being able to defend themselves, but they have ways. Okay, they have ways. There is a molecule called cannabinine. Cannabinine. Cannabinine is very similar to the amino acid arginine. Okay, so here is a picture showing you um, what cannabinine looks like compared to arginine. Arginine is an amino acid, and as you remember, amino acids make proteins, right? They make proteins, and so cannabinine, when it is eaten by an insect, so the plants are basically making this, okay? Plants are making cannabinine, and plants are making cannabinine to defend itself against that insect. Because when insects eat the plant, they end up eating the cannabinine, 
And then they end up dying because what they'll do is they will incorporate cannabinoid uh, into translation. So when the mRNA is being, you know, when the mRNA is being translated and the, you know, the plant ribosomes are making the protein, instead of incorporating arginine to the amino acid sequence, that amino acid sequence, instead of incorporating arginine, it's going to incorporate cannabinoid that it's eaten from the plant. And because there are some differences between cannabinoid, uh, molecular differences between cannabinoid and arginine, cannabinoid will not make a functional protein. If it's incorporated into the amino acid sequence, it's going to make a non-functional protein. And if that protein cannot function, then it won't be able to do its job. Then the protein, maybe it's an enzyme, then the um, chemical reaction won't happen, and then the insect will die. So when insects eat cannabinoid produced by plants, they will die when incorporate, when they incorporate, I should say they, when they incorporate cannabinoid into protein instead of arginine. Okay? Okay, I really think this is very amazing, but plants can get payback. It's payback time, okay? So here we have a uh, caterpillar eating the leaf. It's wounding the leaf, okay? But also in the saliva of the caterpillar, there's chemicals in the saliva that are going to activate a signal transaction pathway. There's a signal transaction pathway that happens within the cells of that leaf, okay? And when that signal transaction pathway is activated, it causes these, uh, these cells in the leaf to start to release volatile attractants. Volata volatile attractants are chemicals, okay? These are chemicals that are released into the air. And once they're released into the air, they will attract a specific type of wasp that is a parasite, a parasite, okay? This wasp will come to the plant and see the caterpillar, and that caterpillar is the perfect place for it to lay eggs, okay? Because once those eggs, those wasp eggs, and you can see them in this picture, once those wasp eggs hatch, the little larva of those wasps will start to eat the poor little caterpillar, and that caterpillar will be eaten and destroyed, okay? So there's nothing that the caterpillar can do. There's no defense that the caterpillar can do because stuck to its skin are these uh, wasp eggs, and these wasp eggs will eventually hatch. The larva of the wasp will start to eat and consume the poor little caterpillar. But it's payback, right? The plant is being wounded, it's being eaten, and so it releases this chemical that attracts wasps to come and lay eggs on it, and then eventually the um, caterpillar will be killed. Okay, and then there's the another way that plants can, oops, another way that plants can defend itself is um, the SAR, okay, SAR um, system, and then there's also the HR system, hypersensitive response system, and then the system systemic acquired resistance system, okay? HR is when the, you have a pathogen or like a bacteria or a virus that infects the plant, it, it will, the antigen will bind to a receptor protein, okay? It will bind to a receptor protein of that plant cell. There's a whole signal transaction pathway that happens inside that plant cell and it leads to the HR response. That HR response, it causes that cell to seal itself off from the rest of the plant, and then it's going to self-destruct, apoptosis. It's gonna self-destruct. It's sort of like, you know, um, part of that leaf, and you can see it in this picture. Do you guys see those yellow dots? Those yellow dots are an indication that there's a viral infection happening. Those yellow dots are where cells are infected and they will seal themselves off from the rest of the plant and they will self-destruct. So you can see here that there are healthy, you know, there's healthy leaves and this leaf has sealed itself off and self-destructed. You know, it's a way of the plant protecting itself. 
it can destroy parts of its body to save itself. Does that make sense? Okay. And also, in addition to, you know, sealing itself before it seals itself off, it's actually going to release a signal protein. And that signal protein is going to travel through the whole body. And that traveling through the whole body is called SAR. SAR. It's systemic acquired resistant. That signal is actually something that some of you may have heard of. That signal is called salicylic acid. Salicylic acid. Salicylic acid um, is basically like an antibiotic. Okay, it can get rid of um, bacteria, uh, and it's also I think it's also um, what are they called? Oh, it's escaping my mind off the top. It gets rid of free radicals. It's an antioxidant. That's what it is. Okay, so salicylic acid people use it. Um, to treat uh, acne okay so we treat it to we use it to treat acne plants use it as a signal and it will be used as a signal for a signal transaction pathway in other parts of the plant and that plant will have acquired resistance against the specific virus okay so the salicylic acid is the is the signal that causes the rest of the plant to have immunity against that specific pathogen. So here we have this leaf that has been infected and then the rest of the plant is now immune to that virus because of the SAR system where the signal like salicylic acid signal which travels to the whole body of the plant causing that whole body of the plant to become immune to that specific pathogen. See, aren't plants cool? Plants are so cool. All right, next topic is quorum sensing that happens between bacteria. So when we look at bacteria, we just think of them reproducing asexually, making more of themselves. But believe it or not, they are pretty cool in that they can communicate with each other. They produce auto-inducers, or AI. When they produce these auto-inducers, when you get enough bacteria producing AI, they are going to communicate with each other, and they will create what we call biofilms. Biofilms are protective, slimy matrices that protect the colony of bacteria. Okay. So if you only have a small density of bacteria, they're pretty producing these AIs, these auto-inducers. Um, these auto-inducers, it's not in high density for the other bacteria to encounter them and respond to them. But if you have a lot of bacteria, a lot of them producing AIs, then the AIs will bind to receptor proteins on the bacteria, causing them to be able to communicate with each other, and then they'll start to form a biofilm, bio okay? So what's happening? is that this bacteria is producing an AI, which is in the shape of this, uh, what is it, a rhombus, diamond, okay? And that diamond um, AI, di diamond-shaped AI, okay, it's just a symbol, that AI is gonna be received by a receptor protein, and once it's received by a receptor protein, it's going to cause um, that bacteria to start making proteins. It's sort of like a transcription factor, but it's not because bacteria do not have transcription factors, but we can call them some kind of regulatory protein that causes that um, a gene to be expressed, and those genes are going to um, cause the, um, the bacteria to make more AI, okay? So the AI received by the regulatory protein causes this bacteria to make more AI. Does that make sense? So it's sort of like a bacteria communicates to another bacteria. Hey, I made this AI. Now you need to make more AI. And then they all start making AI. And then they all start like, hey, we're all together. Let's start making biofilm, which is going to protect us um, from you know, um, antibiotics or protect us from other bacteria, for example. So yeah, under low cell density, they make auto-inducers or AIs, but when there's a lot of bacteria, then you can have these auto-inducers 
being received by more bacteria and then when they are received by bacteria it causes them to make more AI. So when cell density is high, more autoinducers are present, they bind to receptors that regulate the transcription of certain genes. Genes responsible for the production of autoinducers are expressed, resulting in this positive feedback loop. It is positive feedback. It causes, it causes, it encourages more to be made, a process to happen, okay? And then there, there's also communication between um, yeast, okay? Yeast can, communicate. The thing about yeast is that, you know, they belong to the fungi kingdom because they are um, eukaryotes, they're unicellular eukaryotes. They can actually reproduce asexually by mitosis, but they can also reproduce, as they can reproduce also sexually. Another interesting thing about yeast is that they can have a haploid life cycle, and then they can also have a diploid life cycle. So you can find yeast that are haploid, reproducing mitotically and producing more haploid yeast cells or you can have them mate and when they mate they produce a diploid yeast cell and then that diploid yeast cell can make more of itself by mitosis okay so a haploid yeast cell can make more of itself by mitosis and a diploid yeast cell can also make more of itself by mitosis so you can find two kinds of yeast haploid ones and then diploid ones but these haploid ones, you can have two kinds of haploid ones, the A type or the alpha type. The A type or the alpha type. The A type produces a A factor. Um, I don't know why I thought of like the X factor. <laughs> it can produce an A factor protein. And that A factor protein binds to receptors on the alpha yeast, okay? And, um, that alpha yeast produces an alpha factor, and then that alpha factor binds to a receptor protein on the A yeast type. So they're kind of exchanging factors, right? They're exchanging factors. Once they exchange factors and they bind to the receptor proteins, oh no, uh, my Mac is going to sleep soon. Oh, I should have definitely brought um, my cord. Okay. Well, if I run out of batteries and I'm going to have to continue um, filming later, I might need to, let, let me try to finish this really quick. And so when they uh, release factors, they will be attracted to each other. They'll come together. That's mating. They form schmooze, okay? Schmooze are these parts of a yeast that are moving together. And then they'll come together and make a diploid organism, a new A and alpha cell. That's what we call a diploid new a and alpha cell. Okay, I'm going to have to stop recording here because I'm out of batteries. And I'll All right. Hi, everyone. So I'm back at home and it's a, actually a new day. Um, the last section that we're going to talk about is communication during animal development, which we have talked about. So this is kind of like a review. There's a couple of things that I do. I am going to talk about in this video that is a little new, but for the most part, um, this will sound very familiar to you. So during animal development, you're going to see cells going through differentiation. You're going to see cells, um, the embryo starting to change shape or take shape. And that's called morphogenesis, right? So when there are four processes of development, there's determination. That is when a cell's fate is determined, right? It's determined to become maybe a neuron or a skin cell or a liver cell. And then differentiation is when the cell is actually producing that cell specific protein. And you see that when the genes are turned on. And that's something that we talked about very recently about how when genes are turned on, um, there's those cells are making the proteins. And so that is at the, at that point in time, that is cell differentiation, the process by which different types of cells arise. And then you start to see the little embryo taking shape. That's morphogenesis, okay, morphogenesis. The beginnings of <clears throat> the little embryo taking shape. This is where the cells are being organized and then the embryo, there's spatial dis distribution of differentiated cells. Like where are the, you know, where are the eye cells gonna go? Where are the, the, the digits gonna go? Where is the anterior, posterior, um, part of the embryo? Where is the dorsal, the ventral, 
um, part of the embryo going to go. Okay, and then once morphogenesis takes place, then the embryo will grow and it's going to increase in body size by cell division and cell expansion. We're going to really be focusing on morphogenesis in this section. Okay, how does morphogenesis occur? Number one is by induction. Okay, I remember in class I said that induction is a lot like peer pressure. Okay, the cells that are surrounding a cell, they're going to start pressuring that cell to become like them. Cells nearby can influence or direct the differentiation of other cells by releasing ligands. Remember, ligands are signal molecules, usually proteins, or sometimes you might have lipid-based proteins. I'm sorry, lipid-based signals or lipid-based um, hormones. Okay, but in this case, we're talking about um, signal proteins that are going to influence gene expression. Okay, I apologize. I am smiling because I'm getting distracted. <laughs> okay, and so induction, um, you have a cell here and it's releasing signal molecules. And then there are receptor proteins on the surface of this cell, the neighboring cell. And then there's going to be a signal transduction pathway. So maybe there's a whole cascade. Maybe there's amplification that's taking place here. And then eventually you're going to end up having genes, gene expression. And when that happens, that's when this cell becomes differentiated. Okay, so induction is one way that morphogenesis can occur. Another way that morphogenesis can occur is by, um, by cytoplasmic determinants. Remember, cytoplasmic determinants, these are the molecules that are in the cytoplasm of an egg, of an egg, okay? So here we have an egg cell, and when you look at the cytoplasm, there's a lot of um, molecules in here, but there's unequal distribution. There's unequal distribution of these molecules, and we call those molecules cytoplasmic determinants. On one end, you'll see a lot more of these little brown circular molecules. On the right side, you'll see a lot of um, triangular green molecules. It's unequal, it's unequal um, distribution of these cytoplasmic determinants, and that's actually a good thing. It's actually necessary for the development of the little zygote. In the embryo. So cytoplasmic determinants, what specifically are they? They are maternal substances, usually mRNA or proteins. So these little uh, molecules that I talked about, the little brown circles or the green triangles, they are either mRNA or proteins. Okay, um, and when at fertilization, when that cell or that zygote starts to divide, and it divides into two cells, there's gonna be unequal distribution of those maternal, those cytoplasmic determinants like mRNA or proteins that came from the mother or came from the egg cell. And that's going to determine like body orientation, um, where certain parts of the little embryo is gonna go. For example, and I'm just gonna move my head out of the way here. For example, uh, bicoid mRNA. Bicoid, bicoid mRNA is a cytoplasmic determinant. You will find a greater concentration of bicoid mRNA on this side of the egg. That means that when this egg gets fertilized, this is going to become the head or the anterior, the anterior orientation or part of the zygote of the fruit fly. Okay, so right now we're just talking about a fruit fly. <laughs> Okay, and then once it gets fertilized by a sperm, then um, that mRNA is going to be translated. And you guys know what happens in translation. You get the bicoid protein, okay, bicoid protein. And there's gonna be a high concentration of bicoid protein. This is where the head will develop. The head of the fruit fly is gonna develop, okay? And the bicoid protein is also known as a morphogen, morphogen. And it kind of makes sense because where you find a high concentration of this um, protein is where the head is going to form. Morph means form. And so you're gonna see a head forming on this side where there's a high concentration of bicoid um, protein. You know what, I spelled bicoid incorrectly here. Bicoid is B-I-C-O-I-D, that's a typo, okay? It's B-I-C-O-I-D. I think that's the only place where I spelled it incorrectly. 
Okay, another really um, interesting morphogen is um, the sonic hedgehog protein. The, SS, the SHH gene, it codes for a protein called sonic hedgehog, which is a morphogen, which is responsible for hand development. So here's a little embryo, a human embryo that's growing. And you know, your hands and your feet, they actually start off as little uh, limb buds, okay? They're just like little protrusions of, um, of like uh, appendages that are coming out of the little, um, you know, the little embryo, okay? And there is an area, area A, where, um, and that area A is called the ZPA, okay? The, the ZPA, so this is called the ZPA, it's that area, okay, that is going to start um, expressing the hedgehog gene. And so transcription translation of the hedgehog gene will turn on and it's gonna, the hedgehog gene will start to, it's turned on and the hedgehog protein will be in high concentration here, okay? And low concentration of hedgehog on the opposite end. The opposite end where there's low concentration of hedgehog protein will be where your thumb develops. Where there's a high concentration of hedgehog protein, that's where your pinky will develop, okay? I like this graphic because this graphic shows you that the, um, you know, the cells that are expressing the um, sonic hedgehog protein, there's a high concentration of that protein being made in these cells near the pinky and then where the thumb is, very little to none um, hedgehog protein, okay? So the pinky area is where there's the highest concentration of hedgehog, while the thumb has the lowest concentration. Some of you guys might be wondering, why do they call it sonic hedgehog? Does it have anything to do with um, these diagrams? No, um, the scientist that discovered sonic hedgehog, he was a young guy who loved gaming. He was a gamer, loved it, so he just named the protein after his favorite character, okay? And then the last way that morphogenesis takes place is the homeotic genes. And these are groups of genes that control pattern formation, like body axes, where is the anterior end, where is the posterior end, where is the dorsal ventral, where are the wings gonna go, where are the legs gonna go, orientation of where tissue organs or parts go. So when these genes are turned on in certain body segments of a fruit fly, those cells are communicating with each other, causing gene expression. So they're starting to make um, those proteins that are gonna make an eye. They're gonna start making proteins that make a leg, wings, etc. okay? So for example, this gene is gonna be turned on in this body segment, which is going to lead to the formation of a head, uh, head parts like eyes. Um, and then this gene, when it's turned on in this segment of the body, it's gonna be responsible for making mouth tissue, etc. So all of these genes, these are actually called Hox genes, okay, Hox genes, which are a group of genes, um, um, homeotic genes, okay? So homeotic, homeotic genes are genes that are going to determine where body parts go, okay? And so most animals have Hox genes, okay? So these Hox genes, which are a type of homeotic genes, so Hox genes, are a group of genes that are going to be responsible for body formation, okay? And Hox genes are found in fruit flies, in mice, and in humans. Like gene, Hox gene A and B and D are gonna be responsible in mice and humans for um, this part of the body, okay? They need to be expressed in certain segments of the body in order for correct development, okay? And I believe that is the last slide for this topic, cell communication, signal transaction pathways. Okay, thanks guys, bye.